This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 1765, How to Buy Happiness, part one, by David Kane of raptitude.com. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. Now today I have a bit of a longer post, so I'll read the first half today and then finish the rest for you tomorrow. And with that, let's dive into the first half and start optimizing your life. How to Buy Happiness, Part 1, by David Kane of raptitude.com. While I was driving home from my appointment, I couldn't help but feel nervous that I would forget to do something. Peel the price tag off a thing I just bought in case somebody saw how much it cost. I pulled onto a side street and grabbed the plastic bag from the back seat. In it was a puck-sized container of a high-end hair paste. I scratched the little white sticker off. It was $35, and now only I knew. Some paranoid financial conditioning somewhere in my head had me thinking it had been an extravagant purchase. But I thought about it for a minute and realized that no, for what it does for me, it's some of the best value I'll ever get for 35 bucks. I'm 31 years old, and it wasn't until I started going to a well-reputed salon and buying $35 hair paste that I finally began to really like my hair. This was a year ago. My mop had always been a point of self-consciousness for me. I liked myself, but I never got along with my hair. It had evolved over the years from crunchy gel spikes to a number two buzz cut to a polite crop, but it was always a liability. I felt faintly uneasy about it all the time. That problem spread itself across many thousands of days of my life, taking a little, sometimes a lot, of enjoyability from each of them. Thinking back, I can't even guess how many completely useless $35 purchases I've made in my life. Shirts I've never wore, books I never read, drinks I didn't need to drink, restaurant meals I could have made myself. When I consider what it really does for me, this hair paste is an astoundingly good investment. One container lasts about six months, and every day of those six months, I feel good leaving the house, when it used to be normal to feel self-conscious. That alone, the sensation of liking the way my head looks, is worth vastly more than the 15 cents a day it costs me. And that's to say nothing of the endless secondary effects of that very inexpensive confidence. Smoother socialization, better posture, more attention from women, a more easygoing mood, and all the tertiary effects that arise from those improvements, and so on. Considering the real world value it delivers to my life, this stupidly expensive hair paste is one of the most worthwhile purchases I've ever made. All purchases are investments. I have a pile of most of the receipts from the last three months of 2011. It represents thousands of dollars of retail purchases. Each slip is a date stamped record of how much money I decided to part with there and then, and what products and services I got in return. $30 here, $50 there, and there are fistfuls. I can look at most and quickly identify the things that are no longer contributing any value to my life. Magazines I bought at the airport because they were slightly more appealing in the moment than reading the book I already had with me. Desserts I bought with my groceries because I went shopping while hungry. Unhealthy lunches I bought because I'd rather sleep 20 more minutes than make something to take to work. And dozens and dozens of elaborate espresso beverages that gave me nothing more than a 10-minute dopamine hit for $5 a pop. Each line item on those slips represent an investment. For each, I parted with money in the hopes that what I got in return would add something to my life in the form of nourishment, ability, pleasure, or any other quality that improves my days. Some were good, lots were bad. When it comes to our money, we tend to differentiate between consumer purchases and investments as if they're functionally different. But they work the same. As long as there has been wealth, people have tried to grow wealth by investing. We put value into something with the idea that it will return greater value to us over time. 
when we're talking about normal capital investments, getting a 10% return on investment is traditionally the fantastic benchmark. Putting 100 units of value into something and getting 110 back over a year is definitely a success. That's not the area where we have the most leverage over our finances though. When it comes to our consumer purchases, we can do way better than getting an extra 10% worth of value out of our money. All you can buy is quality of life. Making more cash with your cash is the idea of financial investments, but we're talking gains of a few percent over what you already had. By comparison, when it comes to consumer purchasing, the value of what you do trade a dollar for can vary tremendously. 50%, 200%, 5,000%. Between the different ways you can spend 20 bucks, there is a comparatively astronomical range of possible return on investment. And that's because the value those purchases return isn't monetary value, it's experiences. I have a $20 bill. I can spend it on a few lattes, which adds to my life only a few minutes of actual sipping pleasure and maybe an hour of the mild feeling of security that comes with having another sip waiting for me in my hand. That $20 spent that way returns little else in terms of real value and also comes with some liabilities in the form of empty calories and coffee breath. The net value is less than zero. I have nothing to show for it an hour later except the needless calories in my body. Terrible investment. I could have spent that same $20 on two yoga classes and gotten real lasting value out of it. The type of value that builds more value indefinitely. Just the classes themselves are reliable oases of calmness and come with a rare sense of assuredness that I'm not wasting my time or being indulgent. But the bulk of the value comes in dividends in the days between and after the classes. I walk around with better posture. I'm slightly fitter and more inclined to do more exercise. Fewer moments that week are spent lost in thought. I get that mild post-exertion muscle soreness that I like so much. I get a persistent feeling of optimism that can be felt in many of the hours between and around the classes. Good investment. To be continued. You just listened to part one of the post titled How to Buy Happiness by David Kane of raptitude.com. I don't think being frugal is about never spending money. I think it's about living below your means and spending money very intentionally. When you do spend money, it's worth it to make sure you're getting an appropriate amount of value from it. For example, a night out at a restaurant could easily cost me $120. And not that I never eat out, but I don't do it often because I rarely feel that I'm getting the appropriate amount of value for this money. I usually ruin the experience by reminding myself that I could have made something better at home. Not to brag, but I'm a really good cook. And entertaining is one of my favorite things to do. I can save money and have a better experience by inviting my friends to my house for dinner. And that $120? I would much rather spend it on a massage. The value I get from massages is well worth the cost. I also think spending becomes more meaningful and intentional when we align it with our values. If you value quality time with your family, and yet you're allowing yourself to fall victim to the excessive consumerism that forces you to work more than you'd like, then your spending isn't aligned with your values. If your material needs were less, perhaps that would allow you to work less and spend more time with your family. Well, that should do it for today. Have a happy rest of your day and a great weekend, and I'll see you on the Sunday show tomorrow, where we'll finish up this post and where your optimal life awaits.